Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone, if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Catherine on the podcast. She's a, coming to us all the way from Quebec, a full Quebecois, on to share her health and fitness journey and discuss all things health and fitness. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Well... Normally, I would blame you about the wildfires, but you know, I already did that before we started recording everyone, so we're just going to push right past that. But Catherine, just to get things started, why don't you <laughs> just give us your backstory on what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now? Um, so as I was saying, I, uh, I started very young to just get into sports in general. Uh, bodybuilding is kind of new to me. I started about two years ago. Well, okay, so more than two years ago, but you know, we had COVID. So three years ago, um, my boyfriend, who's my coach as well, uh, we started dating and I was maybe 120 pounds, something like that. He's currently 285, so he's a big guy. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I've been into sports. I've been training in a gym, like on and off, nothing too serious. And what if we make it competitive, right? So he started to coach me. And my first show was going to be... Uh, 2019 no no sorry erase that 2020 uh but then all the shows were canceled because of covid so i did like a rebound and i did my first show in 2021 and uh yeah so i really got you know the, the first experience is never the best you know it's like when you cut a pie the first slice is always uh but you learn from it right <laughs> and you can't just shut the door on something you're not uh, completely satisfied with so I'm like I can't just go on stage and be like well okay so that was it and move on so I wanted to get better and so I did two and three shows and then I went my, uh, my pro card uh, not last year what year are we 2023 I'm all messed up at my dates okay 2023 so yep <laughs> I, I, I wanted to see if she could figure out herself everyone but you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay so basically I did two shows done one my pro card and I took uh, a bit more than a year before my first pro show, which was supposed to be this year, but it's going to be next year finally. So anyway, started working out, loved it, wanted to make it competitive. So started bodybuilding competition uh, a few years back. Well, I normally also ask about, you know, like a body part that took off you and a body part that dragged behind, but like your legs, let's be completely honest. I even commented on a fo- when I was talking to you. <laughs> Like, she has photos on her Instagram page of literally some of the tightest pants I've ever seen in my entire life, where, like, I feel like how you're even getting any circulation down there is absolutely ridiculous. How do you, first of all, fit in some of that stuff? And second of all, like, what are your clothing options like? Because, like, you talked about in the off-season when I messaged you that. Yeah. How do you even find stuff that fits? Because, like, you have tree trunks for legs, basically. Well, it's funny you say that because legs are my weakest part, my weakest body part. No, you should see photos from me back then. It's like two ice picks. Seriously. Because all the sports I did, you know, swimming, it was all upper body, like all the way. So I could not train my back for weeks and I would still have the back I have. But if I don't train my legs for a week, it's like they're gone. So, yeah. So they were behind. So I, I gave them a lot of love to give them, you know, the look they have now. And for clothing options, if I do a photo shoot with the jeans, it takes 20 minutes when I'm done, they're off. Like I have to put something else. <laughs> it's really not comfortable. It's even leggings. You have to find leggings that, you know, you're, com- you're comfortable six months out of 12 because off season, everything is tight. Uh, and you don't, you know, you don't want to wear like uh, robes and like uh, it's, you look like a, in a costume all the time. It's like you're wearing drapes, but it's, it's part of the fun. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but you'll never get me to waste 20 minutes to put on or off a pair of jeans. But that just goes to the dedication of this, of that, because, yeah, it is like when I saw that one photo, it was like a black and white photo of you. Like, clearly for a photo show, I was like, good God, like I I've never seen a fo- more of a photo where just the legs just want to just rip open, basically, and just be like, OK. I, but yeah, again, mission accomplished with legs, though, I will say if they were the body part that really struggled for you that I mean. Hey, that's a good problem to have that the body part that struggled really, you know, was able to fill in. But this is also so much more of a mental sport than it is a physical sport. And so many people will just notice the physical changes and say, you know, like, oh, my God, Catherine, you look amazing. But they won't understand the mental changes that have happened as well. What has this whole journey been like for you mentally? 
Um, people who know me know I'm a control, you know, control freak. Like everything has to be like set and organized. And so that's the perfect sport for me, right? Because uh, everything that's meal prep, it's all organized. It's measured. It's always the same thing. And I don't even bother making it look good or making it taste good. It's just if it's chicken and rice, it's chicken and rice. I keep it simple, you know? Um, so for someone like me with a lot of um, not anxiety, it's not that much, but OCD. Yes, that would be the word. <laughs> so it's um, it helps me structure my head basically because it's like I have six hamsters running wild all the time, and this sport is kind of keeping them calm and they have their mission, you know. So I always know what I do when I do it, and it helps me with that a lot. The perfect comparison, because I have, you know, a pretty bad case of ADD myself, is that someone always says, it, it's like if you were to serve one tennis ball, and then you get 10 tennis balls served back at you. Yes. <laughs> and then, yeah. So that's it's, pretty much it. It, it, really, it. I mean, that's probably the best description I've ever heard of it myself, you know, personally. But just with all the stuff that this sport entails, just the mental strength, the physical strength, how have you been able to take the skills that you might have learned from this sport and use it to impact other areas of your life? Because there's so much more to this life than just bodybuilding. But I found that just being a competitor and going through all the trials and tribulations that this sport has, it really does impact other areas of people's lives as well. Uh, I consider myself very lucky because, um, well, A, my boyfriend also is in the sport. He's also a pro. He's also obsessed with everything regarding bodybuilding. So it's it's so much easier for me because, you know, when, when I'm prepping, he understands. When he's prepping, I'm understanding. So it's it's not like I have to fight over, uh, you know, you know, some couples. It's it's hard because the other person wants to go out or wants to do activities. And you're like, well, I can't because I have to eat in 20 minutes. Or So that part of my life is really easy. And I'm, I'm very uh, thankful for that. Uh, as for work, um, I'm also very lucky because uh, I'm a massage therapist, so I can I can schedule, you know, I can my work schedule is whatever I want it to be. So my clients all know that when I'm prepping, um, I can't take as many clients, and they're really understanding and all that. Uh, but I think I got your question wrong, though. You asked me how can I translate what I learned in bodybuilding in my life. Take your it? time with these. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I just realized. So, yeah, so all the structure of bodybuilding uh, helps me structure everything else. But as for the qualities and all the ups and downs, um, you know, someone who's, how can I put this? If you have one goal, you can never get it the first time. Like, it's really hard, whatever the goal is. If the, the goal is a giant step, you always have to divide it in smaller steps. And this sport is exactly that. Rarely have I seen someone being like, oh, you know what? I, I love bodybuilding. Let's try this. I'll do one show. I'll turn pro. I'll do another show. I'll qualify for Olympia. I'll do another show and I'll be Miss Olympia. It doesn't work like that. You will fall. It's not going to work the first time. And the, the, the good part is what you want to achieve is, well, not 100%, but it's physical, right? So the judges give you feedback on what's, what you're projecting. So it's easy to say, like, okay, so if I'm looking for an X-ray, I'm lacking legs, I'll work on that. So your goals are given to you. You know, they, they tell you exactly what you should work with and uh, what you should work on for your next offseason. Well, in life, it's not always as easy, right? So, but you still have to look at the, the big picture and be able to divide it in smaller goals and congratulate yourself whenever you reach one of the smallest goals, even though it's not the big one. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, it makes total sense. And just, I mean, like we said, you just talked about, you know, how this impacts other areas of your life as well. But I have a jealous question now to ask you. How jealous do you get knowing how much food your boyfriend can get away with eating and how much you can't just because he is that massive? Like, cause I, I mean, That's I've talked to, question. I've talked to, I've talked to couples <laughs> and just like the women, they can eat a lot too, but like the men, like they are constantly consuming food. The worst part is he doesn't even have a big appetite. He's complaining that he has to eat. I know, right? I'm like, but some people in this world don't eat as much. Like, just take it as, you you know, you're allowed to. But at, at some point, it's just too much food. It's like 7,000 calories. It's, it's a lot, right? But yeah, so 
it happened once or twice that it was off season and, and I was prepping and he would order food and it would get to the door and like I could smell pizza from the bedroom and I'm like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> but it, it, we usually prep at the same time. So it doesn't happen. And at some point it's like food becomes fuel. So you don't, of course I miss the taste and I miss the flavors and, but rice is rice. You get 300, I get 100. Well, I'm not going to cry over 200 grams of rice, right? So it's not like he was eating all the best food in the world. It's still the same food, just not the same quantity. So I'm not that jealous. It's okay. We get over it. <laughs> so if you guys are both on prep at the same time, who is the one watching over you with prep brain? Because if you have both people on prep brain, good God, I don't know how anything's going to get done. Um, we, We're really good with this. Okay. Like um, we're so organized and... Even though we do work together, we're not always together. So it's like I, I do the meal prep in the morning. He leaves for work. I stay home where I go to work. And like, it's okay. We don't, uh, we're each, each of us is in their own bubble and we like it like that. So no, it's okay. Um, we're lucky. <laughs> How much inspiration do you take from your job when it comes to, you might be dealing with people that might've been dealt a rough hand in life. They're suffering with, you know, physical ailments. How much do you take for that as inspiration for yourself, knowing that like, Hey, I'm a healthy in shape individual and I should be grateful for that. Um, okay. So I have this one client who has a genetic, a genetic disease. He's uh, it's not a wheelchair, but it's, well, it's, you know, the electric chair, like you can't use his legs at all. So when I, when I treat him, I go to his place and he has, you know, these, uh, the same thing they have in hospitals to lift people to get on the table. So anyway, he really doesn't have it easy. Like he can't, he's, he's still working. He's 75 and he works with, uh, like, um, he repairs clocks and watches. So yeah, apparently it's a thing. So <laughs> he's still working and he is literally the sunshine of my day when I have him on my schedule He's such a happy person and you wouldn't, I mean, he doesn't have it easy. Right. And he has two appointments with me a week. He sees a chiropractor. He has an osteopath and it's like, every time I see him, it's like, well, I'm lucky. All, all my brothers are dying. They have cancer, whatever. The only thing I have is I can't run. Big deal. I'm having a lift, <laughs> but everything else is good, you know? So yeah, um, I'm trying sometime to use my own health and my own, uh, you know, fitness to inspire these people. Because honestly, a lot of people who get on my table are um, like, if you're broken, there's a reason. If your back hurts, there's a reason. And even though I'm not trying to, uh, like, it's about the lifestyle. So if you're, you're spending two hours in front of the TV, your body's not meant for that. So I'm not telling you to go in the gym three hours a day and do bodybuilding shows. It's not what I'm saying. But, I mean, there's... there's Tell that to the guy in the wheelchair. Yeah. You know what? Have you ever thought about competing? <laughs> I mean, you could help yourself a little. No, but, like, some people, it's, uh, you know, it comes from posture dysfunction. And, you know, help yourself a little. 30 minutes a day, do this and that. And it becomes a habit and it leads to another thing. And so instead of being inspired by them, I usually try to do the other, other way around, like inspire them to get more fit and take their health into their own hands. You know, I will say some of the most inspiring posts I've seen on Instagram are the people that are either in like in wheelchairs or the amputees that then end up still competing in bodybuilding because it's like, if they can do it, man, who, what exactly. other complaints does anyone else have? Yeah, if They can do it. What is your excuse? Yeah. Right. I mean, there are other aspects of life that, you know, you have kids or whatever, I understand. Well, and I hate to be the guy that says it. I hate training legs and they don't have to train legs if they're in a wheelchair. So at least, at least there's that. But no, I, I always make that, I make day. that, I make that joke to him. I was like, okay, you guys clearly skip leg day. What's going on here? But no, no. So, but it's, you know, that is just, yeah, it is just so inspiring. Yeah. And we got to talk about the number one thing that I would have never guessed in a million years before I started this podcast was the hardest thing for so many guests posing. Would have never guessed it in a million years that it's, you know, one of the hardest, if not the hardest thing. What is your relationship like with posing? Uh, it's a love-hate relationship, like everybody. <laughs> um, so it's essential, right? Because whatever physique you have, it you can't display it properly. You're not going to win any shows, right? Um, so the hardest part for me was the heels. Because I'm kind of a tomboy myself. So walking with heels is not as easy as it may come for someone who's uh, used to these kind of shoes, right? It's also all the, um, 
how can I put this? So you want to look muscular, right, in figure, but you don't want to look too muscular. You still want to flow. So you display your physique and your muscles, but it has to be fluid. And you have to smile and you have to think about everything at the same time. And it's so basically my posing coach, her name is Angela. She's she's a gem. So she's like, you just practice as many times as you can a day. So your head is just in the moment. And she's right. I mean, first show, posing was terrible. <laughs> That's before I had a posing coach. I'm like, I can do this. No, you can't. <laughs> um, and then the second, you know, I know I'm going to do a show, even if I'm off season, even if I don't want to put my suit on, even if I know I'm going to look like, you know, the worst shape of my life, it's okay, I'll do it. Because if it becomes easy off season, imagine what it's going to be like when you're in prep and you look good and it's like you lost pounds. And so the more often you do it, the better. So I, to me, it's on one of my never ending task lists every day, once a day off season. And in prep, it's like three, four times a day. And it's mandatory. It has to, it has to happen, right? It's honestly, I think it's, I never stood on stage not conditioned or not, you know, my shape wasn't ready or no, that, that's always on point. The only thing that stressed me is how am I going to present myself? So that's what I have to focus on. Well, speaking yeah. of presenting yourself, it takes a lot of courage to step on that stage in a bikini basically and, and present yourself to others because no matter how good you look, I mean, you could be the best looking person on the planet. It's still, it's a, it's a scary thing for a lot of people. Did you struggle with that at all? Uh, surprisingly, I did not. I thought I would. So yeah, I told you earlier, I started two years ago bodybuilding, but that was a half lie because in 2018, I tried a, a show, but in bikini division, <laughs> you can imagine it did not went well. Um, I was way too big. With that and... back and those legs in bikini, that would, that would be a sight to see. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about 130 on, on stage and well, I, it was not good. Okay, so I was not ready. Um, I tried really hard with posing, but bikini is a lot of, uh, you know, what you present and like not the sassiness, not not exactly, but kind of. I don't have that in me, so <laughs> I was really stressed to get on stage because I knew I did not belong there. But being a figure and fitting in that division, it's like I'm just, you know, the work is done. So once you're backstage and you're pumping, it's like, what else can you do, right? Unless you trip on stage, which I hope is never going to happen. Like, everything is done. You did your work. You did your cardio. You dieted. You, you, you know, you took your supplements. You, you ate your meals. You did what you have to do. You practiced your posing. So if you were confident a week ago, nothing has changed. Just repeat everything as, you know, you, you practiced. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen, right? That's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> Hey, that's the right attitude to have right there. But out of your figure poses, what is your favorite pose and what is your least favorite pose? Um, okay, so I have two favorites. Uh, my back pose, because my back is one of my strong points. And um, I don't even know how it's called, but you know the one when my hands are on my hips? Yeah. Uh, it's like this, the, the Superman pose, Superwoman pose. Yeah. Correct me. So that one, I like it a lot too. And I hate my side poses. That's just that these are no goes. If you go through my Instagram page, there's none. Never. I don't post those any. Um, never. And that's because I'm, I'm struggling with my core a lot. Like it, it's crazy because if like, I do practice my vacuums, I do abs, I do, but it's just, you know, I told earlier my legs are my weak points. I think my abs are. <laughs> it's really hard for me. So my side poses, I feel like my twists are always off. And it's, it's something I'm really trying to work on uh, this off season. And when yeah. you're walking on that stage, what is that moment like for you? You get to show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on. Um, it's like becoming someone else. It's weird. It's like there's a switch and it's like, well, party's on. So you just, you walk and you do what you have to do. And honestly, with all the lights, you don't even see the audience. <laughs> you're just here. So it's like doing it for yourself. And if you're lucky, because... You know, we don't we don't get to have a routine figures, right? They give you 15 to 20 to 30 seconds, but whatever's playing is playing for music. So if you're lucky, it's something you enjoy and you can pose to that music. And, you know, you're excited to get there. And once you're there, it's, you just want it to be over because it's stressful. 
But once it's over, you're like, oh, it's already over. <laughs> so, yeah. What is the gym culture sort of like in Quebec? And have you been to, you know, the other parts of Canada? Is it different, would you say, the gym culture in Quebec than other parts of Canada? I would say yes. So I, I've been to uh, Ontario a lot. Uh, other parts, like, uh, you, you know, you talked about Nova Scotia and all that. Never been there. Uh, but in Quebec, it's like, you know, I, I really keep to myself as a person. So when I go in the gym, it's not like I, I, I don't really take the time to read the room. You're right? not just I like, just, hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about that? No, that's not me. Where's the uh, bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> but I found that. Okay, so I've been to the States, though. So when we step um, into powerhouse gyms in Pittsburgh, um, it was more welcoming. Let's put it that way. So my boyfriend is big. So when he steps in, like, you're, oh, big guy. So everyone knows him. And, but here, it's like people watch from far. They don't really talk to him. It's like they're shy or something. And, you know, he, he's like me. Like he goes in the gym, he has his headphones on, and he does what he has to do when he leaves. So he's not going to go talk to you. Uh, but when you're in the States, it's like it's like a more open culture. Like people know more about it. And it's like, oh, or even pros, like they come see you. And it's like eventually you're going to compete against each other. But they're still super friendly. And like they take pictures together and they give each other like, um, you know, they work out together and all that. I don't see that as often here in Quebec. I, I'm, I'm just going to put it that way. I have heard comparisons. You can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but that Quebec is mainly the closest thing to Europe that you will ever find in North America when it comes to a lot of that type of stuff. So, and yeah, being in the U.S., it is so. That's one thing that shocked me the most: just how friendly the competitors are to each other. Where it's like you guys are competing against each other. It's just it's so rare in sports. So that's why when I first started this podcast, I was shocked by it because I didn't understand like how are you guys this close when you're competing against each other? But yeah, I guess you know it, it really just is the the way that it is. And I mean. You won your pro card. What was that moment like for you when they announced your name and you realized, oh my God, I'm a pro now? Um, at first, I didn't realize. You know, they, they, they tell your number and you're like, okay, is that my number? <laughs> and then they tell your name. You get your, you get your card and like pictures and whatever you get backstage. And it lasts about 30 seconds and you're like living on a cloud and then you realize, okay, so... I was told that I was the best of the amateur, so I'm a pro. Now I get to compete with the best of the best, right? So it's like starting at the bottom again, right? So I'm going to be on stage eventually with girls who've competed at the Olympia. It's something. <laughs> like, I have to go back in the gym and, like, I have 25 million things to work on. Obviously you always tell yourself like, okay, so I'm not good enough. I still have that to work on. I still have this to do. I still have, uh, you know, my legs are not as big as hers or like my shoulders are not as round as hers. Or, But if you just, if you keep like off seasoning always because you want to be perfect, you'll never get on stage again, right? So eventually I will have to get on stage. I will have to lose or be like be at the bottom and it's okay. And you know, life goes on. <laughs> Well, there's a perfect transition to, into bi dysmorphia because you just exhibited all the symptoms right there of I'm never big enough, I'm not good enough because it it's it's it is what it is. And unfortunately, when you become a bodybuilder, it just gets notched up to an eleven basically when it comes to the whole bi dysmorphia. I this is the I've admitted this on the podcast before, but like one of the dumbest things I ever said my entire life was when I was 18. I had the thought process of, man, the more in shape and the more bigger and stronger I get, probably the more comfortable I'm going to be with my body. <laughs> dumbest yep dumbest thing i've ever thought and said in my entire life and i and i you know i stand with it but how do you deal with body dysmorphia because like to me it just seems so odd and bizarre that i talk to some of those in shape people on the planet and they hate their bodies more than a lot of obese people that i talk to hate their bodies which is it's it's just odd for me well <sighs> You know how my like I'm OCD and everything has a list and it well. So I would take a picture of myself and I would take a ruler with a compass. <laughs> with a compass? Because I you know, I would look at the angles and be like, okay, so if this side pose is pretty on someone, what makes it pretty? 
So it's the angle, you know, with shoulder and the hip joint. And then it crosses here. And then, okay, so I have to replicate that. Okay, you don't need to be massage therapist. You need to be an architect. <laughs> but, you know, part of my job is analyze people's posture, right? So it kind of you know, deviates to that. But I surprised myself like a few times being like, okay, so if this is a good pose and it, aesthetically you're like, oh, this is wow. What makes it wow? And then how can I replicate that? And so I'm really objective about it. I don't think I'm not big enough or I'm not, I don't, I never disliked my body. And, you know, I, I went to Cancun last week. I'm off season. So obviously when I wear a bikini, it's not like I don't have a six pack and I'm just big, you know? People are going to turn around and be like, oh, there's a big girl. I'm not necessarily fit, you know? I'm just big. But whatever. I'm in vacation. You know, it's, it's, it's fine. I don't, you know, I don't live bad with myself because of that. But when it comes to prep, as the weeks go by and you look at your check-ins and you look at your progress picks and you're like, I'm not shred enough. I'm not conditioned enough. Like, this is the hard part for me. And when I'm I'm coming back off season, I look at the pictures. I'm like, damn, I was lean. I was so shredded. But when you're there, they're like, no, no, I still have to peel more. Like it's it's not enough. It's not enough. Your glutes are striated. No, it's not enough. <laughs> like to me, it's it's this is the hardest part. No, absolutely. And I mean, post show blues kind of add on top of it too. Like you talked about, you were just in Cancun off season, but. Has it gotten easier for you to accept your post-show blues as your career's gone on, or is it, or is it still just as hard as it was the first time? And just because a lot of people just, again, the general public is so ill-informed about the sport a lot that a lot of people just don't understand that you're not going to be able to look that way 24-7, the way that you look on stage. No, especially since uh, even before competing, like my body is comfortable at a certain body fat, and it's not a six-pack body fat. Like this is me. <laughs> um, I've come to grips with that. It's, it's, it's the way it is. So post show, if I, if, if I'm not careful, it's not going to take very long for me to rebound and take 15, 20 pounds, you know, it's not a bad 20 pounds, but it's still 20 pounds. <laughs> Thank you for using pounds, by the way. I know a lot of Canadians, they still do the kilo. I mean, I know it's kilograms really? and stuff like that in Canada. A lot of times, yeah, they in use Europe, that. They do, but like us, because we have, we take so much from the U S culture and bodybuilding, okay. we still use pounds. And yeah. Okay, good. Cause I've had some Canadians on here and they're like kilograms and I'm like, I just got to do the calculation in my brain then really quick. And I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I take at least 15 to 20 pounds per show. And the first four weeks, it's like you you still look great, you know, because you were lean with your 20 pounds. But then eventually you lose all the, you know, it's no longer a rebound. You, you just stepped in off season and it happens overnight. And you're like, oh, oh, it's happening. <laughs> Honestly, I'm 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 considering myself very lucky because you know my boyfriend being in the sport and all that is like you're as pretty to me when you're prepping, when you're off seasoning. It's it, it's okay. It, you still look good to me, you know. So I still have like I, I'm feeling comfortable because he helps me feel comfortable. You know, it's not like oh my god, you took you gained twenty pounds. Like please get on the treadmill. Like never happened. You know. So, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't buy you a treadmill for Christmas or anything like that and just be like something to think about or we have something in the basement, but we share it. So. <laughs> no, I know, I know. But it's, yeah. And I found that so fascinating too that the majority of the guests I talk to, they don't even prefer that stage look, which again was what, one thing that got busted for me when I started this podcast is that I just assumed that, oh, everyone just must love that stage look because they work so hard for it. But a lot of people, it's like they like the four weeks outlook or they like the four weeks post show just because that's where they're at their healthiest. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I told my boyfriend. It's the two options. Either two weeks post-show is like a sweet spot for me or six to four. Okay, so he likes to get me ready at four weeks out and then rebound a little. So my four weeks out show looks like my show look. But a six week out is, is kind of cool. So you're, you're able to, you know, you have maybe one cheat a week. So you're able to go out to the restaurant. So that's cool. Uh, maybe you're like at one hour of cardio. So it's not too bad you're hungry but it's not you're not going to eat the walls so it's like a sweet spot so i told him if eventually i decided not to compete anymore i would like to get a six week <laughs> outlook and just hold on to that but again i'm not sure my body is going to love it because it's still a bit more lean than what i'm comfortable with yeah you don't have the absolute skeleton face yet too at that at that time too no, where you're no, just... exactly. that appears at three maybe two weeks out for me the skeleton face what body part 
leans out the har- easiest for you and w- which one is the hardest to lean out? Abs are the hardest. I don't see a shade of abs before two, three, four weeks out. And that's just sad. <laughs> Everyone's like in tank top and like, oh, you're prepping for a show. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have abs. So yeah, so that's my life. Uh, the leanest would be my legs. So my legs year round, even though I have like a puffy squirrel face and I have a three month pregnant look, my my, my legs are going to be striated. So my quads are like horizontally striated year round. That's cool. But again, at least you're not like me and everything goes to my chin basically where I look like if I take a, if I take a wrong angle of a photo, I look like I'm obese basically. It's just like, well, that's me off season. Yeah. I have a really down face. Yeah. It, it, it's starting. See how you're <laughs> the only thing that I can do to counter is I have to grow a beard basically. And then it just hides everything. And then you're just like, you okay, yeah, it. okay. Yeah. There's that at least, but yeah, this, I don't have that option. <laughs> well, you know, you can always just buy one too, you know, eventually just go undercover or something like that. But no, and like, let's be totally honest too. You're not the average looking woman. If you were to walk out in public dressed the way you are right now, you become like a mini celebrity just because it's human nature when people see something that's not of the normal to just be fascinated by it. What has that been like? And have you adjusted to that fact or are you still kind of like, oh, this is weird how much added attention I get? Uh, I don't, I don't even realize it. Like I don't, feel because let's face it if i walk with my boyfriend i was just about to say when you have a freaking tank for a boyfriend i mean it's kind of you're not gonna yeah i'm not gonna get the attention right at the airport yesterday you know it's been the it's it's what like four maybe five hours in flight i'm sitting next to strangers so i'm trying not to go to the bathroom five times right because i'm gonna wake them up every two minutes uh it takes forever to land and blah 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 and i just want to rush to the bathroom uh but then someone sees my boyfriend Oh, you're the TikTok guy. And I'm like, oh, this is never going to (laughs) end. I just want to pee and go home. (laughs) So, yeah, if I walk with him, no one even notices me. Like, he's three times my width. So, if I'm behind him, forget about it. So, yeah. And in in general, I don't, like, I'm not going to walk in the streets, uh, you know, dressed like this. I usually have a hoodie or I put one of his T-shirts on. Like, I'm really low-key, so I'm trying not to drag any attention. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say it's a little bit more conservative, I've heard, in Quebec as well than it is, you know, for other parts of North America. So that, you know, adds on to it as well. But, yeah, again, more props to your boyfriend, though. He does take a lot of pressure off of you. It really seems like he really does. So, you know, that is a good thing because I've (laughs) talked to people that don't have that really fit significant other, and then they are basically your boyfriend where it's literally all the attention's on them and it just becomes, you know – a pain but yeah it i've always just found it fascinating how people react to stuff that they see that's you know not of the normal and we gotta talk about cardio because i hate it more than life itself good god just even thinking about it i you know i love going on walks like i told you before when we were talking about the wildfires but th- it's a different thing when you go for a walk i mean that's not really real cardio to me but oh, it's not real cardio. yeah unfortunately when you come a bodybuilder you're trying to deal with the devil when it comes to cardio what is your relationship <laughs> with cardio um we keep it year round so it's not like I have a three or four month of leniency. Like it's it's always 30 minutes minimum and eight to keep the habit. And two, because, you know, it helps you manage the inflammation with the you know, off-season excessive food. Um, and we have a dog, so I do take her on walks three times a day. So there's that. that okay, tangent fun. time. What kind of dog do you have? Um, Berger Australien. What's that in English? Belgian Mastiff? Um, no, uh, they call it Aussie. So Australian. Oh, Australian Shepherd? Yes. Oh, those are the cutest dogs ever. I love Australian Shepherds. What's your dog's name? Um, Chi Chi. Oh. Do you, are, are you a fan of Dragon Ball? Dragon Ball Z? Yeah. I'm not going to lie. No, but I'm familiar with it. Like I've, cause I grew up in that era. Like I'm, I'm 29. So I'm only two years younger than you. So I, we grew up in that era of Dragon Ball Z. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I know it. Yeah. So my boyfriend is a big fan. Okay. He has a uh, collection statues and all that. And when we got the dog, we're like, okay, so you want to name her something that's related to that, but it's a, it's a female. And the, oh, the only female character we in like Chi Chi is um, uh, Goku's wife. Right. So yeah, that's why we call her that. So I took her on walks regularly. She takes a lot of energy, so that's that helps me with cardio. Um, but you know, I I just I binge watch on Netflix and Prime and Crave. 
archive and everything that exists. So whatever's on, I watched it already. Like I have to have something to watch. My boyfriend reads. How can he do that? Like he's on his Wait, phone while doing while doing first, cardio. Uh, yes. I'm like, how how do you not barf? Like it's <laughs> I get dizzy. Anyway, so that's his trick. He watches. I'm gonna uh, need to talk to him because that's ridiculous. Like what what is <laughs> what's his deal? Like what's <laughs> reading? I don't. But he's on the treadmill, right? So it's like the phone is not moving. Like I'm doing the bike. Uh, I'm doing the spinning because I, I hate walking. So yeah, spinning at least I can, you know, I feel like it's different because I can sit, I can stand, I can, you know, I get myself super like excited with nothing. And there's, the, I watch a movie or, you know, it's, I'm trying to distract myself. What is a TV show that you recommend that you've been watching when you've been doing cardio? Oh, geez. Honestly, lately, everything's bad. So, because <laughs> everything that's good, I've already watched. But uh, something I really enjoyed, you know, I love the psychological thriller, stuff like that. Something that at the end, you're like, oh, that was the answer. You know, I like these shows. Um, have you watched Westworld? Yep. So I like that a lot. I'm not going to lie. After the after the first season, I think it kind of fell off a little bit. I know. That's yeah. what I was about to say. So the first season, like, oh, but then you understand. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like, it I don't want to see the real world. Just stay at the amusement park and have them, like, go to different time periods and stuff Forever. like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's a reason why they were made into movies, because you can just condense that into, like, an hour and a half. But, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the first season, I will say. But then when they really started to get into, like, why they're created, I was like, I don't care why they're created. I just want to no. see them, like... Yeah, like when they did like the SS Village and stuff like that in World War II, and then they did the samurai stuff. I was like, I want to see that type of stuff. Like, I don't care about like. Yeah, let, let me imagine the whys and the hows. Yeah, exactly. You know? just, maybe wait. Just... I mean, you can wait till the last episode to maybe reveal everything. Then I don't care. But it's like, yeah, it's like just let yeah, me. But, yeah, just they entertain just me. For too long. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's the exact opposite of Game of Thrones, where they just completely fumbled the ball and don't even get me. I mean, this will be a ten and a half hour long podcast. If we get into that. I'm still pissed off about that, and I will be. I'm talking to a guest in a week who looks just like the Sophie Turner who played one of the characters in Game of Thrones. So I'm gonna try my hardest to not bring it up because she literally looks just like a blonde version of her, which is you know ridiculous. But see, I gotta, I gotta steer myself clear of that because otherwise, I might even get myself worked up. You know, <laughs> right now talking about that. But sleep is such a such a valuable thing. And I cannot even stress enough how important it is. I mean, in bodybuilding, it is the most important thing. I don't care what anyone says. You can disagree with me on that, but it's no, it, it is. Do you struggle at all with sleep when you're on prep or how do you try to maintain somewhat of a normal sleep schedule? Because people do not understand the leaner you get, the harder it is to fall asleep. So I'm really lucky because wherever I am, if I just do this, I'm going to fall asleep. That's just me. So prep or no prep, I'm sorry. So prep or no prep, it's, I, I keep the same schedule. Uh, I wake up at the same hour. I go to bed at the same time. It's always the same. And I have sleep apnea, and so does my boyfriend. So, the, you know, I started. So wait, are you, so both, first, are you both in your masks together? Yes, it's so pretty. Like Darth Vader, like this. Good night, honey. I love you. Yeah, that's us. I know. Imagine someone breaking in and seeing that. You're like, what the hell? So yeah, the just, first it's year, two jack people in sleep having a mass. <laughs> <laughs> the first year I didn't have my machine and I didn't know I had that. So it was really hard because you know you never recover. You're let's face it, you're tired. Are you gonna go hit a leg day? So your workouts are shitty, you don't have any pumps, like nothing goes well. But the second I got the machine, it really changed my life, honestly. And whatever I'm doing, whatever, like, oh, let's go watch a movie. Well, no, because I got to go to bed at 8.30. Because, yes, I go to bed at 8.30. Because <laughs> I wake up at 3 in the morning. So that's always my schedule. You're really a 65-year-old trapped in a 31-year-old's body. I know. That's what I keep telling myself. I'm really boring. <laughs> if I could wear beige all the time, I would, you know? So yeah, sleep is really important. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'm not going to lie, right? The end of prep, not the stress, not the anxiety, but the hunger, it makes it hard to go to bed because you want to eat the walls. Um, I usually take a bit of CBD oil. It helps me a little, you know, I take it maybe an hour before I go to bed. So it helps with that. And um, yeah, otherwise I don't have any trouble falling asleep. <laughs> At least you're not like, I mean, we're talking about acting old on here. I have one person who does knitting while they're doing cardio. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> that gets to a point where you're just like, okay, do we need to put you in a home or something like that already? Like, it's... But how? Well, they're doing the bike, I think. So, like, they're just are they're just pedaling yeah. with their feet, and then they're just using their stuff to... I mean, that is a true psychopath if I've ever met one in my entire... Like, that person needs to be locked up just for the safety of the public, so... Wow. Wow. I'm surprised. I mean, I've had her on multiple times, but it gets to... I'm just trying to be friends with her because if she snaps, I don't want to be the person that she goes after. So you got to be friendly with those people. you got to be on good terms with them because if they're willing to do that, God knows what else they're going to do. Exactly. Your body bag is going to be with them. (laughs) Oh, that's special. Yeah, and... Whatever whatever helps her get through it, I guess. I, I, I guess, but... Being that you are, you know, from Quebec, I have a Quebec. The thing that's always fascinated me about Quebec, and believe me, I, I'm not gonna lie. Being that I am American, I literally didn't even really know about Quebec's existence until I was in my teenagers, teenage years, until I graduated high school, and I was like, wait, there's a part in Canada that doesn't speak English. What's going on here? So that's how you know edu- the American education system for you that I wasn't even aware until I really went to college, and I was like, wait, what? And just the fact that your swear words are some of the most hilarious things ever, like tabernacle. It it ah. translate. What doesn't it translate to? Like the chair, basically. The chair. Or what does it translate? Oh. No, I I know, but like in in regular French, like doesn't it translate to like uh, an object or something? Yeah. Yes. What does it translate to? I. Okay, so I'm not even sure, but um, in the religion, you know, the the tabernacle. Yeah. It's something that holds. Something else. Okay. I don't know what it is because I'm not religious, but. I Yeah, because then some people, like, there's a comedian that said, like, oh, it just translates to the chair. And I was like, there's no way that's true. And I looked it up and it was like, I didn't find definitive proof, but I found that, like, yeah, it is something that, like, holds something. So it could be a chair. It could be a. So it's something. Like people took whatever word were in the religious, yeah. uh, you know, vocabulary. And you just, you yell it with a bit of anger in your eyes and it becomes a swear word. That's what I loved about that's what I love about Quebec French is that it basically it's just an it's object. Right. It, yeah, it, all it is is you just gotta say it in a certain mindset and then it's really you know just like a, a swear word which is it's hilarious because I because I had a Spanish or I had a roommate from Spain in college and he always talked about how they viewed people that spoke Spanish like in Mexico or in South America as like oh they don't speak the right version of Spanish and then you talk to some people from France and they're like oh the people from Quebec they don't speak the right version of French and stuff it's always funny how the people from like the country that it came from and then the British they're like oh you Americans butchered our language blah 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 and, st- and they are it's funny just how everyone always views that and so that's why you know I had to ask that bring it up but if someone were to walk up to you and say you know Catherine we made a decision you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it would be one thing that you'd like to see changed. Oh, that's a tough one. Saving the tough ones for the end here. I don't know. I used to think that the the way people qualified for Olympia was weird, but they changed it. And I agree with the new version. So I can't say that anymore. I don't There's something about the culture. Okay. So it's one of the only sports so let's say you win a pro show. Okay, you win what, like two grand? But it costs you twenty to get there. So it's 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 one of the sports that you don't really get recognized. Like, you know, it's it's a big bubble and it's not really common. People don't really know about it. My parents don't even know what I do. If I tell them I'm a pro like bodybuilder, they're like, So what do you do? And like, okay. Or like people ask you, because, you know, when I'm off season, I, I have sort of a CrossFit shape, right? So I'm just jacked and big. And they're like, oh, so when you do competitions, you throw weights. And I'm like, no, this is not exactly what I do. So it's like people don't really know the sports. And the only thing they know is what you see on the news, which lately is this one died of a heart attack. This one died of this. And this one died of that. So the the image of the sport in general is like okay, so big people with like drugs and death. That's that's what people know about the sport, which sucks because honestly, I know a lot of people who, uh, let's say in their teenage years, they struggle with body image, with confidence, with this and that. Throw them in that sport, like it's 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 a building environment. Like it, they're gonna you know get better and. They have a goal and their personality and this and that. But people don't know about this. They just know about big guys that. Well, and you mentioned that is your boyfriend your coach? Yeah. So what is what is your favorite thing about having a boyfriend as a coach? And what is your least favorite thing about having a boyfriend as a coach? 
tough one, tough one. Um, honestly, he's, he's he's been able so far to really distinguish the moments, you know, when he speaks as a boyfriend or when he speaks as a coach. And because I work with him with his other clients, I can tell you 100% he's harder on me <laughs> than he is on other people. But that's fine because I'm also hard on myself and I want the best result possible. So if you need to, you know, make it tight and this and that, well, I'll follow whatever you ask me to do, right? But the expectations are harder because he knows me. It's like, I know what you're capable of, so I'm going to push you until you get there. And there's no like, oh, but you look so sad. Let's give you a cheat meal. Never, never going to happen. There's one year, the year that, he, well, it's the same year, but the, in June, he won his pro card. In October, I won mine. But in June, two weeks, no, two months before, he was prepping me for the same show. And at some point, I'm like, stop it. Like, just, just do your thing. I'm going to find someone else to prep me for the time you're doing your show because I want you to stay 100% focused on yourself and then we'll take care of me. But at some point, it's hard to be like, okay, I have to think about you. I have to think about me. And so, so sometimes it's like all melting together. But it's, you know, we've, we've all been able to, to work it out. And it's, uh, it's clear now. Hey, and that that's great. And honestly, yeah, you can really not get away with much if you have your significant other as your coach because they know everything. So that's a, that's a little negative then, I guess, myself. But if someone were to walk up to you too and say, you know, Catherine, I really want to get in shape. I really want to just get started on my fitness journey, but I don't know how. What would be the best piece of advice that you'd give them? Oh. Um, okay, so there's no simple answer here. I always go with what they have compared to what they want. And again, as I told earlier, just bring it to smaller goals and smaller steps. You know, uh, if someone comes up to me and they're like, I want to be like you, I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> so you want to plan for the next four years of your life. <laughs> but, you know, what, what, where are you now? What is your goal or your expectations? And what are you willing to put in? Because it's not everybody who's willing to do cardio every day or diet really strict. And, and it's okay. It's fine. But you have to manage your expectations. Yeah, so that would be the key word, the key advice. Manage your expectations. Yeah, well, mine, some, but. mine too would just be like, yeah, don't go full on Rambo. Don't go training like some people I know where they go for three hours a day and they last a week. And it's yeah. just, we're about to see that with New Year's resolutioners too. Better, I mean, it's like. It's better to work out twice a week for a year than work out five days a week for three weeks yeah you know you I, go start slow just say so you have to um in french we say adhere au plan so stick to the plan and as long as you're able to stick to the plan then you can increase the volume intensity or whatever but start slow and just keep it up yeah. just don't don't uh, you know absolutely and let's be honest everyone has those days where they don't feel like working out they feel like crap they don't want to go to the gym how do you push through on those days? Where do you think that that motivation, that determination comes from? Uh, I think it's 10% motivation and 90% mental conditioning. Because before I was talking to you, I was actually doing my chest lift, my checklist. <laughs> so I have a grid. <laughs> and, you know, I have a smartwatch. Every time I go to the gym, I start it. it not that the workout doesn't count if it's not on, but... And I have Can I tell you that I'm also one of those people where I have to start a lift at like an odd number. So it has to be like 1135 or it has to be like 1140. Then that's, that's when I start my workout. I'm like that too. So, yeah. Okay. So we understand each other. Uh, so I have a commitment to myself. I told myself I'm going to go six times. I told myself it has to be an hour. I told myself I have to reach, I don't know, 500 calorie a workout. If I don't do it, there's a blank space on my checklist. And it's like I lied to myself. I'm going to disappoint myself. So, yes, there's a motivation. There's a bigger picture. There's a, okay, but if I want to be the best, I have to do the best. And so I have to do everything right. But on the day-to-day -day basis, it's just, you just go through the motion. You have to do it, just do it. Don't, don't, don't sit for two minutes and ask yourself a question because you're going to stay there. 
just go <laughs> do it once you're in there you have no choice i yeah i couldn't have put it better myself and when we do have you on in a year where would you like to be at in your bodybuilding journey where would you like to be at in your overall life what are some goals that you'd like to have achieved a year from today um so obviously i want to do at least one pro show uh i also told my boyfriend well if i do one might as well do the year so i'll be competing this year for sure um but you know he's he's not way younger but he's 24 and i know he's gonna compete for so we're talking years. to a cougar yes <laughs> <laughs> well i'm 31 it's not that big of a difference but yeah uh so i know he's younger than me so i know he's gonna compete for a long time and well if eventually there's the family you know pictures if you want to have kids so next year i know i want to compete but after that, we're going to seriously consider uh, me stopping for the babies. Yeah. I was going to say, you got to hurry up. He's not getting any younger. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's all on him, right? <laughs> it is, you know, so no, that, no, that's great. And I cannot wait to see what, what you look like a year from now and what you do. I mean, please don't train your legs too much because dear God, I do not want to be talking to you and having to like, <laughs> I'm going to like fix, and I'm not joking. But like I'll have photos of her popping up when we're talking about her legs. Cause like I saw that and I was like, okay, that's just absolutely ridiculous. But Again, you know, everyone, go and give her a follow on her Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below. And buyer beware, you will get inspired to get off that couch and stop eating all those Twinkies. But again, Catherine, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing your journey with us. It was an absolute delight to talk. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you were able to understand me with my Quebec accent. I did the best I could. And um, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to be honest with you. I spoke to Norwegian yesterday. And the day before that, I spoke to someone from Mexico who was living in the U.S., so my English is perfect is what you're telling Yours me. was better than both of theirs. <laughs> so yeah. it's no big deal. And I'm speaking to someone later this week from Slovakia who has not, probably not the best English. Oh, so, so don't worry. Like it's now granted, I am talking to a 71 year old after like literally half an hour after I'm done with you, who is from Arizona and she's like perfect. And she still does like, she can still do like 20 pull-ups, which is the craziest thing I've she ever still made. Still meeting doing the cardio? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, the one that's doing the cardio is younger than you. I'll just say that. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is why I said that that's shocking because like, yeah. first of all, lady. So, you know, <laughs> any, anyways, again, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right, everyone. This is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.